Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Planning Period Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Shreffler. Before we get started with this week's episode, I want to update you a little on the plans I have for the podcast. Today marks the official last day for teachers at my school, and my summer has officially begun. As most of you are probably aware, education podcasts typically take the summer off. While I fully understand why and respect that choice in those other podcasters, I don't really want to do that. Still, my schedule for the summer will be less ordinary, so I will be making some adjustments through the months of June and July. For the next two months, I will be releasing episodes every other week instead of every week, getting back to a weekly schedule in August. I will also have some special episodes, like some recordings and interviews I will be getting during my time at ISTE this summer, and potentially other interesting interviews I collect during my various summer travels and engagements. This week's guest is David Knufke. I met David, as I explained in the interview, through a Twitter chat known as EdChat. We had a lively discussion and thought it would be an interesting interview for the show. We talk in this episode a lot about the reality that the pressure is put on teachers, both externally and internally, and I think it's just a great discussion for anyone in education that feels like they're not able to express themselves as freely as they'd like sometimes. So, sit back and enjoy episode 5 of the Planning Period Podcast, my interview with David Knufke. Alright guys, welcome to, I don't even know what episode we're in, episode blank (laughs) of the Planning Period Podcast. I am your host, Brad Streffler. I'm joined today by David Knufke, with the pronounced K. Very nice. Uh, David Knufke. He is an area director of science <laughs> something thing at, yeah, uh, at, the, at his district in Deer Park, New Jersey. Yeah, uh, New York, but that's New okay. York. I got yeah. it close. I was so North. close. Yeah. And um, so I, I wanted to talk to him today because we met on Twitter during an Ed Chat and we had did. some interesting discussions. <laughs> so I invited him to come on the podcast and actually my first remote interview for nice. the podcast. So Breaking I'm, ground. Yeah, I'm trying new things here. Bre- <laughs> I like Breaking it. out. So... Uh, but David, if you would, please tell me a little bit about yourself. Let us know who you are. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Brad. I'm glad to be on. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It was a uh, an example where um, an Ed Chat conversation, it was like the old days when I used to use Ed Chat and like actually <laughs> moved into a nice little conversation. So it was really cool. Yeah. So uh, I'm Dave and I teach, I don't teach anymore, I guess. It's an old habits, I guess. I'm the <laughs> curriculum associate for science and technology at the secondary level in uh, Deer Park, New York. And so that's uh, Deer Park Union Free School District. And so I run um, the science department and the the CTE kind of technology department uh, for my district for grades 6 through 12. And I've been doing that now since September. And prior to that, for the 13 years before then, I was a science teacher in uh, the exact same district where I am now. Just taught a whole bunch of kids science, which was uh, an absolute pleasure and an absolute joy. But now I get to help them... A dedicated staff, a uh, wonderful staff, do the same thing uh, as best as they can for, you know, a factor of 10 more students, I suppose, which is great. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, kind of how I got here, I suppose. And uh, glad to be here. Cool. Thanks for, uh, again, thanks for joining me. I appreciate yeah. it. Tell me, just, this isn't really my first question, but I'm going to ask right. it anyways. You know, how has that transition been for you? You're so new to it. You just started in September yeah. out of the classroom. How does it yeah. feel getting outside those four little walls? Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. I mean, for me, I had been engaged in so much informal leadership in our department and just formal leadership for the district and other capacities for such a long time that it was a little bit different, I think, than somebody who might have been coming into a brand new district, for instance, right? I was I was pretty well steeped in sort of the culture of how things work in Deer Park before I onboarded as as the uh, sort of formal administrator for for the departments. But it is definitely it's a different kind of work. Uh, I'm sure that you found that uh, yourself in your own in your own journey to be Absolutely. an administrator. Um, you know, I always I don't know. I, I and I think people respond to it different ways. And I think the kind of administrative job that you wind up doing can uh, can affect this as well. But, you know, every day is different, right? There's always something different going on uh, from day to day, which is fantastic. I feel like at the end of the day, uh, the work that I've done, it doesn't really come home with me in most capacities, not like it probably used to when I was a teacher. But of course, the thing that you miss is, I mean, you miss time with kids. You know, I think if... Yeah, I, I think good teaching is a uh, kind of a performance in a lot of ways. You know, uh, maybe not overtly, like on a, like a like you know on the stage, but at the same time, I think good teachers and good performers use a lot of the same 
techniques and tools when they do their work. And I think that when I was done with a day where I was just like really nailing it as a teacher, you know, where every period I just felt like I was knocking out of the park, I was, you know, pretty physically exhausted. Uh, I don't feel physically exhausted most days as an administrator. Um, I feel like at the end of the day, I can go home and I still have a little bit of space in my life. I have a young uh, young son at home. He's four and a half. I'm trying to enjoy as much of that uh, aspect of my existence right now as possible. And so it's, it's a better job in that sense for kind of a work-life balance, I think, than maybe what I had as a teacher. But eh, teaching kids is fun. You know, I still jump at the chance anytime I can to get in front of really anybody and, and teach. It's just a, it's a great job. And I, uh, I respect the people who do it a tremendous amount. Yeah, a lot of what you described is, is similar to, to my progression out of the classroom and learning to get outside the four little walls. But Yeah, um, I'm sure. You know, it's, I think a lot of us probably feel the same way. But one thing that I have said on an earlier episode of the podcast that I will always love about being out of the standard classroom environment is I can pee whenever I want. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good observation. That um, is really you nice. Know, I, I hadn't actually really thought about it, but you're absolutely correct that, um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing, it is a luxury that teachers do not have. And I mean, I don't know what you guys are obligated to do teaching wise during your teaching day, but so for us, you could teach three periods in a row. So that could be, you know, that's, that's uh, two hours and a bit of instruction. And man, at the end of that, you, you, if you needed to go, you really needed to go. And maybe you found a colleague to cover it for you. I, I would totally remember like poking my head into prep rooms or like looking out the door to see if somebody was coming down the hallway. Just be like, can you can you stop in here for five minutes? Keep eyes on these guys while I go while I go to the bathroom. And you're right. That is definitely not something that I have to uh, think about anymore uh, in this job. The other thing is, and, and I mean, I, d I don't know if you have kids, Brad, or not. But one thing, the first time that, that our son got sick this year and preschool called and was like, you need to come and pick him up. I was able, cause I just didn't have a busy, you know, schedule of meetings and so on for the rest of the day. I was able to basically arrange what I needed to arrange for the rest of the day in about five minutes and go pick up my child, which I, I mean, I just remember scrambling to make sure that I had, you know, periods of lessons ready to go for the emergency sub or, you know, trying to juggle between myself and my wife about who would have the space to take to take off and go get him. And man, that was a real a real perk of becoming an administrator that I don't think I, re I realized till I finally had the opportunity to put it into practice. Yeah. And actually, I do. I, my son will be five this nice. month, actually. So they're very close in age, yeah, our, very our close. children, when you said that. But uh, yeah, definitely. That's another one where, you know, the, <laughs> the kid gets sick. I can go run and pick him up. I don't have yep. to wait and hope somebody can pick up my room. But also, like, little things. I can go to, like, dad breakfast and right. his pre-K sure. and things like that. Like, there are some really great advantages that I didn't think of as right. disadvantages <laughs> when I was in the classroom. No, like, When of I was in the not. classroom, it wasn't like... It was just kind of like, okay, I can't go to those things. It was never something I really thought about. But right. now that I'm out of the classroom, <laughs> it's something I realized I can go see him and have like a brunch for an hour at his preschool. And I mean, granted, I get like store-bought muffins. But still, like right. I can do that with doesn't my matter. Son, that's cool. Yeah. So, that's great. I mean, I, I had the same – like the first time it happened and I, I just went to all of my friends who are working with me as administrators and just like – I never realized this. And they were like – Yep, that's a uh, just a huge a huge benefit of moving here. I mean, teaching is hard hard work and I mean, I'm not going to pretend like my job now is not hard work. It's just like a different kind of hard, you know? And it's uh, uh I just I have nothing but respect for my department. They're doing great work. The administrator role I feel is more a normal hard. It's right. a hard that real people outside Correct. of education can understand. <laughs> when you haven't been a classroom teacher, I don't know about you, but whenever I tell stories to my friends, like such and such happened at school and I'll go into a right. story, they look at me and they go, you're making that up. I don't think, <laughs> I think all my friends think I'm a compulsive liar yeah, when I was not. a classroom teacher. They never believed anything I said, yeah, it's a, but it's they a all really happened. Job. Yeah. <laughs> so. Nice. Well, let's move into my first question and we'll sure. get right into the, to the heavy stuff here. So tell me, what is the biggest problem facing <laughs> education right now? Man, it's, it's hard to pick one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, my brain does not usually go to absolutes. I think there's there's many there's many things that I think we could point to as problems. But I think the there's sort of where I keep coming back to. There's this seems to be this fundamental tension in American education between a, um, sort of a, a a struggle to 
be considered professionals if you work in education and sort of the expectations that come along with that. But at the same time, treating teachers as professionals outside of those external expectations. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's there's often a movement in in various policy circles and so on to do more innovative things and to ask teachers to do take on more and more responsibilities. But I don't necessarily see the um, the 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 other side of that coming along for the ride, right? I see a lot of particularly, um, you know, I see a lot of funding being cut for educational programs. I see a lot of those things happening, and it seems like various people want to have it both ways, which I think can be really problematic. So I, I think that a lot of the issues that I find in education come from that that sort of stance, I suppose that 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 those competing tensions. You know, I, I was thinking earlier this year about videotaping teachers, for instance. You know, I, I think it's really hard as a professional to get better at something if you don't see yourself doing it. And so I think videotaping yourself teaching is a, is an amazing opportunity to learn about what you're doing in, in the classroom. But I think if you want to implement something like that, it becomes very difficult, and 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 becomes very difficult in New York State for a, for a variety of reasons. And and I should I should say right up right up front, I was a, a union vice president for my district for ten years. You know, I I'm I'm a very I come from union parents. I don't think that the union difficulties that you would run into if you brought this up are are unreasonable or coming out of nowhere. I I think that they arise from this you know, this this culture in which the unions were developed in sort of the 60s and 70s. You know, when my dad was first teaching, he had to sign a loyalty oath to the United States before they could give him a job, right? When my mom was first teaching, she couldn't wear pants in the classroom. The unions were the mechanisms by which that was all changed. And certainly all the benefits that we have in New York State in our teacher corps are a direct result of sort of what the union does. But, you know, at the same time, that becomes somewhat stifling if you want to do something like have a program where teachers videotape themselves. It's it's possible, but it needs a certain amount of creativity. And I think in order to get that creativity, you need to you really need to convey as a as an administrator, as an administrative team. Right. That that the reason you're doing this is not to play gotcha or not to find teachers at their worst, but really just to help help teachers improve. Right. And so that's a, one specific example of something that's come into my mind recently. But I find all of this. It's always kind of up against this this tension between the sort of the job of being an educator and treating educators as professionals. I don't know if that makes sense. It was certainly a mouthful, but that's kind of what I'm thinking about these days. Yeah, we don't look for short answers here. On the <laughs> well, you didn't get podcast, one, so, so that works luck. out. It's interesting that you you talk about the disconnect of the two, and I feel like there's a lot of things we could go off of with that. But we actually struggle with the recording of teachers as well in our mm. union. Our union here in Florida has basically said. Don't do it. Right. If you're an administrator, don't even ask. Right. If you're a teacher, always say no. Right. We've had similar kinds of things. I wonder how much of that is based on internal pressure within education versus mm-hmm. external pressure outside of education. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good um, – I think that's a good question. I, I, I can see a clear – like there's a clear liability issue i think if you're if you're recording yourself interacting with kids right the district is opened up to issues if those tapes were to be you know used for some other purpose other than sort of the initial purpose of it and I, and, I, and i understand that and there are um you know external pressures in that sense um certainly i think i think you can do it but i like and this is not to say I mean, just the videotaping thing is just an example. But like, so for instance, with that, I think if you sat down, you got your your union leader in the same room with, you know, all the other sort of big decision makers and you talked about the purpose and, and you, you had a conversation about it, I would be hopeful that you might come to some sort of this, some sort of middle ground where you could do it. I know with us, we, we tried to do something a couple of years ago where we had teacher leaders, we had a teacher leader program, which was great. Um, you know, I, I was one of the teacher leaders. It was fantastic. We got grants, we got, you know, all sorts of good stuff. And one of the things that they opened up was this opportunity to um, to be filmed. And then uh, these lessons that you were being filmed were going to go on to sort of a, a state clearinghouse of filmed lessons called Engage New York. And our unit really took the position at that time, right, the teacher's unit, that that was not a thing that should happen. And uh, basically flexed their, their muscle and, and, and no teachers wanted to do it. And I can, I can understand where that comes from on, on, a, on a 
on one level. On the other level, I feel like it's a it's a roadblock that prevents what I would consider to be a really kind of unique opportunity for a teacher to, to look at what they're doing and help them develop as professionals. When I talk about external pressures, I, I think back to think back to our conversations on EdChat actually, right. and also, and I we didn't even talk about this, but I've written about this in the past. This idea that teachers are held to an absurd moral standard outside of the classroom that I don't feel like many of us actually live to. Right. <laughs> and, and I think about it this way, and this is where I sure. always think about it. I, I talk to teachers a lot, and one of the things that I regularly hear people say is, I don't want to live really close to my school. Okay. I want to live 15, 20 minutes away from my school. It's, a, it's an annoying drive, right. but I don't run into kids at the grocery store, sure. and I'm not in the checkout line with a bottle of wine and one of my mm-hmm. kids behind me. Yeah. Or I'm not at a bar having a beer and one of right. my kids is behind me. And... To me, there's an absurdity to that entire thought process. Yeah. Not that I haven't had it, but there's still an absurdity that would – if I were if I were a car salesman and I ran into someone that bought a car from me and I'm having a couple of beers, that would mean nothing whatsoever. Right. Absolutely. And yet we have this moral standard that we're kind of expected to be held to that I don't know we can maintain. And I think the recording of classrooms falls in that same vein. Is like if they were released outside of the classroom, maybe a joke that we meant as a joke could be taken out of context. Right. And the, me- the media is going to jump on board and they love to make a school look bad. Right. There's a thousand ways we can take that. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, there's this – there does seem to be more of a pressure on teachers and educators more broadly to draw like really clean lines between their personal life and their working life than what you see in, in you're right, in basically any other profession I can think about. And it is, it is an absurd kind of way of being, but, and it's got, but it's also got like deep, deep roots. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, like the, the contracts for teachers from like 1915 or 1920. And it was like, you know, the teacher could not be seen in a, being in a, in a car, being driven by any man other than, you know, her her uh, her brother or her father. And, you know, all of these restrictions that really seem to go way, way back in terms of sort of the American conception of what an educator is and what an educator is supposed to be. You know, I certainly have on, I, I mean, you know, I run a, a publicity Twitter feed for my school, right? And then I run my personal Twitter feed and I, I I certainly have it written on my personal Twitter feed. This is my personal Twitter feed, you know, RTs don't equal endorsement, you know, it's, it just, you do seem to feel that pressure, even though you're right, it is absurd. And that's where we started talking during the Ed Chat. We talked about, you brought up the concern that regularly the Ed Chat topics don't touch on political issues, questionable issues. Right. Uh, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but <laughs> no. that was basically where we, you know, we started a dialogue back and forth and where I said that that Ed Chat may not be the place for that. Correct. And mainly because of this same external yeah. pressure to not express those views. Yeah, so this Ed Chat thing of of sort of my my feelings about Ed Chat's inability to talk about controversial topics or political topics. Let me stop it, you for two seconds for yeah. my audience that may not be involved. Sure, no, please. Ed, Ed Chat is a <laughs> weekly Twitter chat. Yeah, and it's fantastic. Pretty much by educators, with educators, all teachers and administrators and, and a bunch of people, and they have a weekly topic. Every week, they send out a poll to vote for three or four topic choices and decide which one will be discussed that week. And then on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe 8, I don't really remember, <laughs> but at Tuesdays at 7 or 8 p.m., everybody gets on. They use the hashtag EdChat to keep the conversation flowing. Typically, Tom Whitby runs most of it, sure. and he puts out the questions and things like that. I, I should also say that I have been on the Ed Chat podcast, so oh, I guess nice. in terms of a like all clarity kind of thing, yeah. just putting that out there. And I, so I, I do love Ed Chat, and that was where this conversation started with us. So I just for my audience, no, that I doesn't know. I appreciate the the clarification, Ugh, Brad. I don't. know. When did you first get on Twitter as a as a teacher, Brad? Like when did you first get on Twitter? Well, I've been on Twitter since pretty early on. Yeah. Uh, but in terms you of really, both. in terms of really using it as a teacher, mm-hmm. I didn't start doing that until about three years ago. Yeah. So I mean, I think I was on Twitter initially 2008 or something like that, right? I definitely remember Obama announcing that he he was going to like announce who his vice president selection was going to be on Twitter like two minutes before they sent out the press release, and I remember being on Twitter at that time. So that puts me back 2008. And I, I also didn't start using it as an educator right away, but I started pretty quickly. I think by about 2009, I realized how 
chats were being used, right? So this idea of using a common hashtag to kind of filter out everything else so that people can have a conversation. And 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 I will, and I'm sure you'll say the same thing. If anybody out there has never participated in one, you should participate in one. It's an amazing opportunity Absolutely. to really broaden the amount of educators that you can talk to. And if you're like if you're like me, it's it's like being a kid in the candy store the first couple of times that you do it for <laughs> sure. It's great. You meet all sorts of really cool people. And EdChat I think is probably, if not the oldest educational chat on Twitter. It's right up there. It's it's in in many ways sort of the gold standard of of educator discussions, and and they do use this model where 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 that you they put out their topics on a poll, right, and you vote for which one you want. There used to be two per week, and uh, people would vote on two different topics because they had people doing it from different countries, and they've since uh, they've gone back down to one per week, and people vote on the topic. Um, and it's great. You know, Tom is a local guy to us, right? He's he's Long Island, and um, he does great work. And I think everybody who's putting together EdChat is fantastic. But particularly over the last six months, and, I, and I'm not going to – I don't want to even uh, – whatever. I'm a New York guy. You can figure out what my politics are. It's, uh, I'm not keeping them a secret. But – uh, aside from what the politics are, there have been several political developments over the last six months that I think are are interesting for educators uh, and might be worth, you know, talking about among educational groups, right? I mean, the, the election of, of Donald Trump, however you feel about it, might be something that has resonance for education, right? And the appointment of Betsy DeVos, however you feel about her, is maybe something worth talking about. And, and um, there have been several moments sort of in political life over the last six months where they've happened on a Tuesday <laughs> and, or they've happened on a Monday night. Like the DeVos hearings were on a Tuesday. I think they were on a Tuesday night while Ed Chat was taking place. But because of this model of how topics are selected, um, where you vote for the most popular topic and you do it in advance, there's really no mechanism by which Ed Chat can, you know, switch gears and move to a political discussion, right? There's no like ability to call an audible. There's no mechanism in there to say, yeah, you know, almost always we're going to go with this voting model, but tonight because, you know, we had this once in a lifetime confluence where the uh, the controversial education secretary nominee is being heard in Congress, right? And it's on C-SPAN. We're going to, you know, tonight we're going to do this instead and we're going to talk about it. So there's a structural constraint there. And I think you're absolutely I think, right. Now, I will say this. I think yes. that part of it may be a bit of a cop out because it would be very easy for Tom and Shift Paradigm and those guys sure. to quickly just go, hey, sure. this is what we're talking about tonight. And sure. it's not like we could argue with them. We're right. participants in their Correct. show. So we could argue with them. I, I don't think it's a I think it's a bit of a cop out to say there's not a <laughs> mechanism for it. I will say this, though. It. I don't actually take it back. I'm going to let you go because I'm yeah. about to get ahead of myself, I think. Yeah. So I, I'm going to I'm going to say that um, there's no formal mechanism. Right. And what I mean by that is that the way Ed Chat has always worked, as far as I'm aware, and I'm not an Ed Chat historian, but I've, I've been aware of it for a long time. It's always used this topic voting model. And so I, I agree with you that if 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 the if the organizers of ed chat and 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 no no harm here right these guys volunteer and they're doing they're doing good work absolutely if if they take the position that there's no mechanism by which they could do that then i would agree that's a cop out i don't think they've ever really formally said anything like that so i don't want to mischaracterize anybody who's involved in that process's perspective on this but <laughs> what there's this there's this issue there where the, the topic selection model does not lend itself to current topics, right? It, it lends itself to current topics on the span of maybe weeks or months, right? The things that are in the zeitgeist. But at the same time, there's no mechanism. It, it doesn't lend itself to things that are coming up instantly. And I think it also, because it's the most popular topic, it, it's going to be weird to have any situation where the popular topic is also the most controversial topic. Like, I don't think that the most popular thing is frequently the most controversial thing. I mean, sometimes it happens, but it usually doesn't. So if you put up a two, you know, three topics to, to choose and one of them is, is some controversial political topic, I don't think that's ever going to float to the top of the pile, right? I think most people are probably going to want to talk about other things because a political conversation is a difficult conversation. It is an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. It is hard for a lot of people to engage in a political conversation and feel like they're being respected and also not 
uh, feel like they're going to accidentally treat somebody else disrespectfully. So I think that there are mechanisms at play in the Ed Chat sort of topic structure that that prevent political topics from from being discussed or controversial topics more broadly. And it's just recently it's been kind of like a theater of the absurd at several moments when you have you know these these issues that are taking place that are going to have huge effects on everybody who's participating in ed chat at least in the united states and, and they're talking about something totally unrelated and so that's so just something i've noticed so i guess the the obvious question and i would probably ask any student the same thing why uh, other right. than the popularity side why is that the case is in ed chat or otherwise yeah, I don't know. I mean, I there are some there are great uh, educator chats that definitely that definitely you know hook into more difficult conversations, right? Um, you know, Educolor's one I think that you had pointed me towards, which I thought was great. Uh, what was the other one that you had pointed us towards in that conversation? Um, I didn't. One of the other guys involved. It was Educolor, Educolor and We Lead Ed. I think were the two. Yeah, and I thought those were great. I was. Uh, his, his tag is the weird teacher. Uh, he, he, he runs his own little chat and he talks about anything he wants. So sometimes he'll go and have uh, a really interesting conversations because he's the guy kind of calling the tune on that and is not, not beholden to anybody. But yeah, I, why? I don't know. Uh, I, so let me, let me propose something. To yes, you. please. Cause you and I had a pretty strong discussion about this on Twitter and it was yep. great. And now you're talking in person and your voice is attached to it and everything else. And you're very intentionally avoiding your own political opinions. Yep. I, I mean, I'm not, I've, listen, I'm a liberal. I mean, I'm no longer a registered Democrat. I'm an unaffiliated guy, but I'm unaffiliated because I feel like the Democrats are not sufficiently liberal. You're talking to a guy who's, who's far to the left. I, I, I don't hide that in, in really any aspect of my life. But I also, and I will say this, I, I do not feel that politics is the end-all be-all at the same level what I did when I was a younger man, right? So when I was a younger man, I was I was much more overtly political and willing to kind of get into, you know, really, really heated discussions with people who felt differently from me. And and we had life events that occurred in, in our lives as a family where it was just a reframing of sort of priorities. So uh, I know that I, in the last, you know, five to 10 years, I've moved to kind of still feeling incredibly strongly about the things I feel incredibly strongly about. And anybody who finds me on Twitter will, will you know, see me tweet the same kinds of things that you know anybody who feels politically like I do would. At the same time, understanding that good people can feel very differently from each other politically, and that doesn't make them any less good. But I guess my question is, do you feel the urge to not express your opinions just because it causes difficulty for other people, or is it because of your profession? No, so that's a really good question. I feel that... You lose part of your audience when you express your political opinions. And so when I express my political opinions, I've made a choice to to do so, understanding that there's going to be some number of people who are probably going to turn me off, tune me out, so to speak, right? Whereas, you know, if I'm talking about something that I want a more broad audience to understand, um, I will tend to keep my political opinions more, more away to myself, unless I feel like there's something... Unless I feel like some tremendous injustice is being done, in which case, you know, then I want people to understand and I want to wear my politics pretty squarely on my sleeve. So you wouldn't say it's because of your profession then? You I don't think did, so. It's more about keeping your keeping your audience for what you do. Yeah. And, and just, uh, man, I don't know. It's is it my profession? Maybe it is. You know, I think it's I think it's important to have in order to bring everybody into the into the kind of common purpose of educating children. Um, I think that you need to kind of hit people where they live. And I think that if you don't, if you if you can do that without kind of confronting their political issues up front, right? If you can get to a place of, com if you can start from a place of commonality and then go from there, I think you have a, you have the opportunity to have a bigger effect. Okay. So I'll tell you for me, I, yeah, I definitely lean towards saying that I don't express my opinions often, especially in political, religious, and major social questions. I tend to keep them to myself, yeah. mainly because of my kids. Yeah. And when I deal with students, and I deal with my students, that is not part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly struggling with that problem, yeah. but it's, it's the impression I'm... It, we are all but directly told, don't talk about those things sure. in the classroom. Sure. You don't express, because we're supposed to be the neutral ground. And it comes back to that idea of sort of losing your audience in the sense of, I don't need my students who say I'm a liberal and I have conservative students, right. then I don't need to lose them immediately. That has nothing to do with my content. Correct. 
and and I understand that, but at the same time, outside of that realm, I have definitely been pressured before to take opinions off of the internet yeah. or off of places I've been at. That is unfortunate. I've written about this on my blog. I was nearly fired over a blog post I wrote. Mm. Um, and it was not because it was political. It was because it was an endorsement of a product. <laughs> and And in the same... <laughs> blog post I happened yeah. to have one of the screenshots of using the product included the logo from my school and I had a very formal yeah. letter from my legal department telling me that that had to go or I had to go <laughs> Jesus. and it was there's a much more drawn out process and if you really care about it you for my audience you can read yeah. about it on my blog I'm gonna but, go and read that because I'm very interested in it man that's um that's a different experience than anything I've, I've ever had. And, and this may be a function of geography. It may also be a function of what I teach, right? Or what I taught. So, you know, I taught biology and AP biology for years. And um, when you teach science, you're going you're gonna to move into quote unquote controversial territory as a function of what you need to teach kids with, with some frequency, right? Because you're going to be talking about evolution. You're going to be talking about vaccines. You're going to be talking about climate change. You're going to be talking about all these things. And then, of course, you know, also consider my geography, right? I'm on Long Island. So to me, I often had to be conscious of the fact that most of the kids in the room felt the same way about these things that I did. But there was some small minority, for whatever reasons, that felt differently. And I really wanted those kids to feel safe. And I wanted those kids not to feel like their beliefs, which were different than the majority's beliefs, were... Um, wrong, right? I mean, you know, scientifically they may not be grounded in science, but that's not that's not the point of holding a, a creationist belief about evolution, for instance, right? You're not looking to have a belief that's grounded in science. You've you've staked your claim elsewhere. I've always tried to be conscious of that, that, you know, I wanted the kids who didn't feel the same way that I felt to still feel like I cared about them, that I respected their feelings, and that they were always welcome if they ever wanted to, to come to me if they wanted to talk to me about these things and I wouldn't judge them or belittle them for their beliefs. So I, yeah, I, I, there is that dimension to the hesitancy for teachers to talk about their politics for sure. I, I don't know that we have an, an agreement on Ed Chat. I still, I kind of feel like maybe that isn't the place and I, I like that there are other places for it. I think it. you're right. I, 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 would be, I would be curious to see if if you got Tom or whoever to add a... Betsy DeVos, for example, <laughs> question or as a topic as one of the three choices on yeah. a given week. I would be curious to see what that pulls. I don't know. There there sounded like maybe that has happened in the past and maybe I just haven't caught it. Yep. Um, but I, I haven't <laughs> seen that be one of the options before. Well, I think she was uh, she was in the news again yesterday because uh, I don't know if you caught her or not, but she was <laughs> she did, was yeah. resoundingly <laughs> booed at a college <laughs> commencement speech that she was giving at a historically black college. And Man, I I can't point to any time in uh, history where an education secretary giving a commencement speech has gotten a reception like that. But at the same time, I, who makes these decisions? Like we're going to send uh, Secretary DeVos to to this college to give this speech. Yeah, I mean, she kind of she kind of got what she but but they really set her up for it, I suppose. But yeah, she will continue to be in the news on. Fortunately, but there will be opportunities, I suppose, to maybe tweak the Ed Chat topic selectors and see if they want to put her on there. But I, yeah, I, I mean, I'll be shocked if it ever, if it ever becomes the topic to choose. I think you had the solution. Other people had the solution in our conversation that the solution was to only have the topics be controversial topics one week, right? In order to force <laughs> the conversation, which would definitely do it. But I think it's, uh, I don't think it's where Ed Chat is really positioned. I think you know, Ed Chat's really. It's become, I may, you know, earlier Ed Chat it may have been different, but, you know, things change, you know, and I think, I think Ed Chat is now uh, focused much more on places on in education where people largely agree or have questions that can get easily answered, right? Let's talk about maker spaces, which are great. I'm not knocking maker. We're looking to put one in, you know, in our district. I love maker space. I love the entire concept. But it's not a controversial topic, right? It's not a controversial topic in in any way approaching anything political, you know. So it's uh, it's a totally different kind of educational space that EdChat occupies, I suppose. Well, and I think not to not to sort of pull on current 
social issues. But I think it also is a bit of a filter bubble in that right. we are very much like-minded participants. Mm. We are tech-centric typically yep. because we're on Twitter as a professional right. development method. And we are all looking to, most of us at least, push forward education or else there'd be no reason for us to do these chats. So mm -hmm. I think in some sense, even if we had, and I think I made this point, but even if we had those discussions, it's not like we'd have a lot of dissenters right. to what the opinions would be. I don't know right. that we would get a lot of varied opinion in those discussions because I think we're probably fairly similarly on the same page. Yeah, I think you'd probably get more dissent with a political topic than you do with the sort of the normal topic. Uh, the, the entire... The <laughs> you, entire think we, you think we agree more on makerspaces yeah, than we do on President I, Trump? I'm, I'm going to guess we probably do as a, as a community. The, the entire Twitter as education professional development tool, it's something that... So I was trained in my scientific training, you know, to be to be critical of everything, but to be like doubly critical of the things that that most agree with you, you know, like you should be e more skeptical of the things that that kind of intuitively make sense. And Twitter as a as a professional development tool is an amazing tool. I don't I don't think that you can say it isn't. But I I have over the last two years, three years, really become sensitive to that to that filter bubble aspect and to that lack of sort of criticality in a lot of the things that get said in the sort of edu Twitter circles. A lot of times things get said and then they just get retweeted, right? You don't really get a lot of rich discussion. You don't get a lot of challenging discussion. And I, I wonder how useful that is. And I think it's useful to a point, certainly. But I think that as as you kind of grow and develop in that in those edu Twitter kinds of circles, Maybe the returns you get from it diminish diminish a little bit over time. I, I don't know. There's a lot of things going on in that connected educator space that seem to be taken as truisms because we feel that they're true, but they've never really been, you know, held up to to scrutiny. And I I, I wonder about that. You know, there's this. There's I, this. I will say I will say this yeah. though, and and I want to point this out. Yep. I think you're right. As you are someone, and I am someone who's an active participant in those right. events. I think there's a whole series of people and a significant percentage of people who are lurking. Right. I, I don't I don't mean to imply the negativity there, but no. they're not participants, they're right. watching. Yeah. And I think those are the people that may be getting the benefit. I think you're of, absolutely right. Of hearing from people like and I and I'm no expert by any stretch, but at least hearing from people like you or me who are willing to put what we're doing out there for better or worse. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. You know, it's always been central to my practice as an educator to put kind of what you're doing out there. I mean, it's the only way you get better, right, is by engaging in those in those conversations and, and talking about them. I think there's a there seems to be a bias in, and we're uh, maybe going a little far afield, but th there seems to be a bias in in the sort of educational Twitter community, uh, unsurprisingly, towards being a connected educator. And I think being a connected educator is an incredibly important thing. But I, I, I got to think there are teachers out there who basically keep to themselves. Maybe they lurk a little bit, you know, but they basically keep to themselves. But they're probably doing amazing, amazing things in their classroom. And you might never be able to get them on Twitter for whatever reason, right? They may just be totally disinterested in it. As a, as a digital coach who has multiple times I'm, tried uh, to get staff members <laughs> to use Twitter, I can tell you that is 100% true. I've, I've also had that experience. <laughs> I think about some of the teachers I, I work with who are doing just amazing things. And they have no interest. They don't have the time or the inclination to go and get connected in the way that uh, I think the is usually used when the connected educator is spoken about. I want to know what's going on with those guys, too. You know, I don't just want to know what's going on with us. I want to know what, what's going on with those those guys and gals as well. So I think uh, summing that first question up here, I think we can say that one of the biggest problems in education, <laughs> if not the biggest problem, is the very clear disconnect between what we internally want to do in our classrooms and what some of those external pressures yeah. may look like, whether those be district pressures or outside education pressures. I think we can agree that there is a very clear disconnect between those two things. I think you're right. Let's go to my second question here. Sure, not man. To, not to kill a transition there with absolutely no, it's nothing fine. whatsoever. You, you got to transition at some point. Don't worry about exactly. it. Exactly. So my second question for you is what is something you are doing that you wish all educators would do? And given that you've been out of the classroom, if you don't want to pull from current, you're welcome to pull from last year or whenever. But what is something you wish all teachers would be doing? I, I, I mean, and this has followed me along here. I think there's tremendous power in, in computational thinking when working as an educator, just in terms of the amount of 
time that it saves you and that thereby increasing the amount of power that you can have to do the kinds of things that you want to do. I mean, I don't know any teacher out there, any any educator out there who feels like they have enough hours in the day. There's a million projects that we probably all want to do. I, I felt that pressure more so as a teacher than I do uh, as an administrator. I feel like I've got a little bit better time management as an administrator. I, I've always found tremendous power in approaching things from a computational perspective. And what I mean by that is taking the, and this is just you know one small s- small aspect of the larger notion of computational thinking, but taking the repetitive things that we do and finding ways to automate those. Um, I think that that's tremendously helpful. I think anybody who's moved to Google Classroom over the last five years can see, can see kind of what we mean when we talk about that. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many of us out there remember like trying to use Google Docs with a class full of kids prior to the advent of Doctopus, probably still my preferred way of doing it, but Google Classroom does the same thing, right? To provisioning, I definitely, you know, I definitely have done that yeah. in my classroom before those it's, things existed, it's and madness, it's impossible, right? It's it's like crazy. And once you once you move to a system where that's all being handled for you programmatically, all of a sudden you're like, how did I ever? <laughs> why did I ever do this this other way ever before? And I, it, that's just one example, but like I think you get tremendous tremendous value out of saving yourself these 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 time sinks everywhere and if i could just sit down with anybody who's who's doing workflow kinds of things in ways that i think are 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 not quite that optimal then i i, I we have some conversations talk about things talk about different ways of doing business i think you get tremendous tremendous benefit back from being able to offload those things so if i could spread one thing a little bit further, you know, to to your audience, I would say, you know, think about what you're doing in your life. Think about the things that are repetitive time sucks, right? That you have to just do each time, you know, and, and see if there are ways to go about those a little bit more programmatically so that you don't have to put in all of that effort, you know, try to move it a little, your, move your interventions a little bit more upstream in the system to use the jargon right try to try to do these things and then have them feed out from there i think is is tremendously helpful and so i would i would encourage people to do that um it's a little bit probably more practical than sort of the big picture kinds of like awesome pedagogy things that i'm sure a lot of people share but i've I've found it's just you get tremendous benefits from it that's such a that's such a cool answer to that question because I've, one of the things I've been dealing with recently internally and, and struggling with is I'm very tired and sick of people telling me that every time I suggest something, but when, what right. time, right. are you paying me, blah, sure. blah, 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 blah. And I look at it as I, I feel like I've always been someone who's been doing, and, I, and I, I've never used this terminology before, but this computational thinking kind right. of thing. But I've always been someone that used my time efficiently mm-hmm. and found ways to manage that. And I think that's that's such an interesting way to look at it. Is like, look, you know, we all we know all teachers don't have time. So my suggestion is find correct, time. make time. Yeah, and and any administrator out there, anything you can do on your end to to kind of nudge your teachers towards these kinds of efficient uh, solutions to these issues is going to be a tremendous benefit for the culture of your of your department and I think helps to kind of give them examples that they can hook into. You know, one of the first things I did when I when I onboarded this year, I just thought about the things that bothered me as a teacher in the department and I tried and I just started working to fix those. And so like one thing would be, you know, we'd, we'd always get this stuff emailed to us and Back then, so we've since moved to Gmail. This problem probably wouldn't be quite as bad, but we had a a, a physical out, Outlook Exchange server, and we were using the web client from like 2009, and it was just it didn't work. I mean, the search didn't really work. It was just t- totally inefficient. And you know, whoever the boss was at the time would email us the information, and I would then either have to you know capture that information, throw it into Evernote or whatever I was using at the time and be able to go back to it that way or or that information was functionally gone you know it was it was not going to come my way again without a lot of effort on my part so you know one of the first things i did was i just threw up a a google folder like th- that i just shared with my entire department which is called science and tech and so everything that i share with them i just kick into that folder so like that way they have one place where they can go and they can easily get access to all of this stuff and they don't have to feel like they have to go and search through all of those all of those things it's just a it's like a, just one quick example of a really easy thing that you can do. And then once you do that, 
you don't need to overtly necessarily point out to your teachers. They're going to pick it up. They're pretty smart people. And they're going to be like, oh, that's cool. He's got this like folder that we have access to where everything is. I wonder if I can do something like that with my own with my own classes. You know, I wonder if I can put up some place where that happens. And some teachers get about that, you know, website wise. Other teachers, you know, handle it with a Google Classroom or something like that. But you just start modeling these things for folks and then they'll start to take those balls and run with them and they'll start to adapt them. And I don't know about you, but I've always been in the situation where, like, my ideas are okay, but if you take my ideas and you modify them, they're probably going to be better, and then I can steal them back. So, I mean, I think that's how you. <laughs> I, I think that's how you get that that kind of culture of, not to be too jargony, but you know, if you want people innovating and doing things in new ways, I mean, I think that's the way that that's a good way to go about it. I do a weekly email to my staff. I'm a digital yeah. coach, and so I do a weekly email to my staff called Tech Tuesdays, yeah. and. I give them little tips and feedback and things they can do, and you know, I, I intentionally focus on them being short snippets mm-hmm. and very quick things they could right. use for the most part. And without fail, and I'm just realizing this as you're speaking, but without fail, it's the ones that save teachers time right. that they I get the most response sure. and most benefit out of, not the ones that are so beneficial to the student. Yeah. But at the same time, but it if, I'm, the if I'm giving the right. teachers more time, Correct. they're going to use that time to, be, or at least I hope they're going to use that time to benefit kids. hundred so percent. It still works, but. I would say about five years ago, I was, I focused on, when I was a teacher, I focused on trying to contact homes more frequently. I felt like I wasn't doing it well. Uh, I was getting by because I was teaching AP bio and honors chemistry. You know, I didn't have to contact homes all that often. And it seemed like an area of my practice where I really wanted to develop. And I, and I sat down and I thought to myself, you know, what are the what are the things that are keeping me from doing this in the way that I really want to do it? And, and it was just it was just the time, the time investment issues. And so, you know, we just you just develop a series of structures that help you take care of that. I mean, I, I don't know if you know it, you know, text expander, Brad, Do you know, that web the program. It's a it's an OS X program. I think it's now on Windows also. And um, it, it just lets you save snip like w- repeatedly use snippets of text um, that you can recall and put into anything by just, you know, by typing in a short character code that's, you know, identifies it. And so one thing I started doing was, you know, any kid who scored below a 70 on a test, I sent an email home. And what you could do with Text Expander is you could, you know, you could save the template of that email and you could put in, you know, drop down fields. So like you could drop it in and then you could just fill in the fields with the kid's name and what the score was and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, the thing that would have taken me, you know, a a little bit longer to do became much, much shorter to do. And so it became much easier for me to do it. And all I had to do is just remember to do it and throw them out there. And man, I mean, that was one of the things that parents would just be like, I can't believe you're like, I never get communication like this from 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 teachers. And, And the reason why is because, you know, most teachers just don't, it's not that they can't do that. It's just that when they think about it, they don't think about it from that from that sort of programmatic perspective. And so as a result, it doesn't seem like something that's tenable when you're lost in all of the things that you have to do throughout the day. I wanted to ask you a question about your, your Tuesday article. So I send my staff a, a PD piece every Thursday. And then what I've what I've started to do with those, and I vary it. It could be a, it could be you know classroom stuff. It could be time stuff. Sometimes it's just a fun thing. You know, you try to have fun with it. And then what I've what I've done is I've taken them all, and I just put them on a spreadsheet in, in Google Sheets, and I just use the publisher of the web on that. So that's like a web page, so that they can always go back, right? And they can just pull up that web page and just go through all the stuff that I've been that we've been sending them. And then or I recently uh, showed them how to how to filter things so they could filter articles. You know, if I, if I start each one, you know, with Thursday professional piece or whatever I call it, you know, you can make a filter in your Gmail that's going to just label those so that they can just click one place and get them all. I think if you show people these things, it gives them more power and they feel more comfortable. Yeah, I do something similar. I have a, a general tech repository, right? Perfect. Um, that's a, that's a shared Google drive location. Yep. And they, it, it literally is, it's in the signature line of my email. Yeah. And so that, Every single email I send, it has that link is at the bottom. Like anything you want to find is right. there. And then I just built a Tech Tuesday archive folder in there where I take exactly. the body of the email, save it as a Google Doc, and that's a whole just Tech Tuesday archive of Perfect. all the emails I've sent. So it's the same kind of thing. And and every time they say, like, where is this? I'll be like, yeah. look at my signature line. Absolutely. Click, everything's right there. I love it. 
Nice. Yeah, you talked about you talked about that that text expander for my audience that maybe isn't Mac OS X or doesn't have install abilities on a school computer. Sure. I do something similar, but I use existing software. So I just build all my formatted emails right. as sig as signatures in Outlook. Oh, that's nice. In Outlook, smart. So then all I have to literally do is like hit new, yep. tap the signature button, and go failing test score right. and. Bop, 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 and I just do the quick replacements and then add it to parents email address and boom done so it's a little bit it's not maybe not quite as quick because it doesn't have the drop down options right. but, but it's it, the same purpose if you can install stuff yeah, yeah. so I, I agree with you completely Gmail has the same thing with the canned responses which I think does the same thing you know and these are things that, you know, they don't get publicized unless you have somebody like yourself telling a staff of people about them right and showing them how they do them um, so it's always good to have uh have a man behind the curtain who's willing to show you how the machine works, I suppose. <laughs> I like the idea of being the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, um, man. The wonderful and powerful office. Absolutely. All right, let's, uh, last question for you. And this is one of my personal favorites because it gets into a little bit of personal sure. stuff. So who is the best teacher you ever had? Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm bad with these best things, but I, I can talk about several different teachers that I've had throughout my professional life in, in different roles. I mean, so the... My parents were both teachers, and and they played major roles in why I wanted to be a teacher. And my father was a biology teacher for his career, and I I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a teacher. I think by the end of high school, I basically had figured out like in the land of regular jobs, like you know, I'm, I'm if if I wasn't going to play music for a living or you know write novels for a living, and I had to go and get a regular a regular job, quote unquote, uh, that teaching was probably going to be it. You know, a little bit of research experience in college. And and I was like, no, it's definitely going to be teaching. And the reason why uh, I wanted, to, I decided to teach biology was because my, my high school senior AP biology teacher was just unbelievable. And I mean, you know, looking back on what he was doing with us in the, you know, mid nineties, he was doing things that, you know, our standards are only now coming around to. He just kind of under, he had a good native understanding, I think, of what real science education looks like and sort of what the what we should be doing to train students to be uh, scientists. And so, um, you know, Rich Kurtz is always is always one of the people that I point to as sort of a, a major influence in my in my working life. And, you know, why I became why I became a teacher, he just had not only the passion for the subject, but also just in retrospect, as I became a teacher, like looking back on the things he was doing. I mean, the guy was just working, working miracles in the classroom. And I mean, since I've become a teacher, I just get I try to get mentorship from everywhere I possibly can. You know, I think it's really important, even from people who don't relate to the job that I might be doing at the time in exactly the same way that I do. There's always wisdom to find in a in a building full of teachers and in a building full of educators everybody has something to teach you but thinking about some of the the bosses that i've had the ones that resonate most strongly with me are the ones whose practices i've most tried to emulate and i also think about my in in my capacity as a teacher for the district i was a district mentor so new york state has a as a formalized mentoring capacity for first year teachers um, and i was one of the district mentors for 10 years and a lot of those folks actually really helped me as as a teacher because they they came in with new ideas. They made me think about the things that I was doing as we talked about the things that I was doing and um, definitely made me better as a result. And many of those folks are in the department that I run right now. Um, and I still look at them as just tremendous, tremendous uh, mentors for me and, and helps in not only this new work that I do, but just also in just kicking around ideas about uh, teaching kids more broadly. How about yourself? I did talk about my AP senior year AP lit teacher uh, in an earlier episode as my one of my favorite teachers. Uh, but you mentioned biology, and I haven't told this on the podcast yet. So my AP senior biology teacher was someone who I, I just feel like I learned so much from as a person. Nice. And she, I took, I had her class for biology. I, I was always an honor student and had advanced classes and everything. And, but when I got to high school, the one area I wasn't super involved in, I, I didn't really like math or sciences. I mean, I did fine in them. I had good scores, but they weren't something that interests me. I was very much about reading and social studies and stories. I wanted stories even then. And so math and science were, I'm not big on, but I figured math, I needed to take rigorous courses, but science was the one place my freshman year, I allowed myself to not take a super rigorous course. And I took this like integrated like science class my freshman year and it was terrible and I hated it. And so my sophomore year, I was like, all right, I'm gonna take like an honors level bio course. And 
the teacher I had, Miss Jen Forsyth, who's that's not her name anymore. It's Jen Barnes now that she's married, but <laughs> she is she is absolutely amazing. I couldn't agree with you more. She is a fantastic biology teacher, one of the best you, biology teachers I know. And are you um, serious? Yeah, absolutely. She's a fantastic fantastic biology teacher and i mean i would hope that if you asked her about me she would describe uh she would describe me as a good friend uh she's a fantastic lady and i am i am so glad that so i mean we we didn't talk a lot about <laughs> about me and like the fact that i i basically know every biology teacher in the country yeah. uh, but this is a good demonstration of that fact that's uh that's amazing does she know that you're doing this uh this podcast yet uh, we are friends on Facebook, so yeah. I assume she has seen it. Uh, yep. She is one of those people, though, that that had such a profound impact on me, both educationally but also per- personally. You went to and, school in Georgia? Uh, I did not. She wasn't in Georgia ah, at the time. She, got it. I, actually, interestingly, I'm originally from Georgia but moved to Florida in middle school All right. and had her in Florida in high school, and then she moved to Georgia. So. Yeah. Um, interestingly, that is crazy that you know her. Like we genuinely didn't plan this. Like, <laughs> no, we didn't. Awesome. I was thinking She's... about. I was. I was thinking. I was. The, I was thinking about. It. I was like, I should ask him who the teacher is because you know that it could happen, particularly in AP biology circles. Sure enough. Sure yeah, enough. That's crazy. That's fantastic. Yeah, but she is the one of the best teachers I've ever had. Yeah. One of one of maybe two who are my former teachers who I'm actually like friends with on Facebook mm. now. And one of those two is only because he's also a teacher at my school. Right now. On. So I feel like she's really the only person that had that kind of profound long term impact on my life yeah. that I constantly point to as just the example of being an involved and amazing person to sure. her kids. But also making us learn. Yeah, that is a that is a top notch example that you've uh, you've uh, chosen for yourself, sir. So uh, <laughs> hey, nice I'll nice choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool that you know her. Now yeah, I'm like man. kind of like embarrassed. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> you've uh, you've 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 done her proud here. I'm sure. Hey, that's good. Cool, she was, man. She was an awesome teacher. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, you know we've I don't even know how long we've been going at this yeah. point. We've been going a while. Yeah. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for us? No. I think we've we've ranged pretty far afield. Uh, you know, I think it's really important that this kind of work that you're doing here. Um, you know, I think it's important for teachers to really and educators more broadly to be to be advocating and showing the work that's happening in classrooms and and to be talking to other educators. There's a lot of misconceptions about what educators do. I think we get a bad rap in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, I commend you for doing this. I wish you all the luck in the world. And I know, you know, I, I, I diligently added you to my, to my podcast crawler out there. Um, and I, I can't wait to see what you do with the show. This is episode number of less than 10. I'm sure it sounds like you have I think a couple it'll in be, the can. I think it'll be five. And that's, um, and that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you know, keep at it, hang in there and, uh, and just keep, keep doing this work. It's important work. Hey, I, I really, I, pr- I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. That's so much more than I feel like I'm deserving of. So <laughs> I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I'm just making stuff up as I go the, along. That's so. the best part. Yeah, that's that's what I did in my classroom for years. Why not do it on a podcast? Absolutely. Well, thanks again, well, Brad, for having me. Absolutely. David, thank you. David Knufke. Yes, did sir. I get that? Yep, you got Twice it. Twice nailed it from New York. I'm going to get it right this yep. time. I will say, I said New Jersey, and you didn't like crawl through the camera and strangle no. me. I feel like New York, New Jersey people are pretty particular about that. Yeah, we can be. I guess we can be. It depends on the. It depends on the New Yorker slash New Jerseyite, I suppose. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, I thank you for thank you for sitting here and talking My with me. I really pleasure. appreciate it. Yep. And uh, you know, have a great night. You too, sir. Thanks for listening. I I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. And thanks again to David for coming on the show. I appreciate that. As always, I want to close out by saying thank you to my listeners for all the support. Lots of you have reached out and told me that you like the show, and that's awesome. If you want to know the best way to help, leave a review on iTunes. Tell me what you like about the show and what could be better. Or reach out to me on Twitter, at Brad Schreffler. If you don't want to make it public, DM me. Those are open. You can always go in there. Um, That's also the best way to reach out if you'd like to be a guest on the Planning Period Podcast. Maybe if you think you have good answers to my three questions. As always, thank you to Kevin McLeod for our intro and close music, Vicious. You can find his work at incompetech.com. And I will see you all again in two weeks. Enjoy your summer.